trust you. All right, let's get started. I had a, an epiphany last night. Um, I'm going to start recording my lectures and posting them on Canvas. Um, so take that with whatever you want. If, you, if there's something confusing in class, that would be a great resource to, for you to use when you study or as you're doing your homework. Um, so I recommend these aren't organized. It's just a, a webcam of me, um, which is pretty ter terrible for me. Um, hearing, you know how you hear yourself talk on camera? Um, me just talking for 50 minutes. Okay, so if there's something confusing or an example, okay, I recommend you on your notes writing what time that happens. Okay, because we started at nine, so you know roughly it'll be better for you sorting through 50 minutes of me talking, which is terrible for everybody. Um, so we'll try that. Um, today is the first, today is the pilot. Um, I literally thought of it last night. Um, so I, we found a mic and we're just recording it with the webcam. So um, that's available for you. Use it, don't use it. I don't care. Um, a couple logistic things before we get into actual interesting statics. Uh, Pre-lab next week. Okay, write this down. There will be an announcement on Canvas. It will not be on Wednesday. Okay? It's going to happen on Tuesday in your lab section. Okay? So you have a two-hour pre-lab okay, on Tuesday at that time that's blocked out on your schedule. And this is because we are doing a design competition for our Lab 4. This is the one that historically has been the funnest and gotten the best reviews from the students. Um, but because of that, it takes, and because of your class size, um, it takes some time to set up. So we need, we need that full two hours. Um, so pre-lab next week is during your, um, your lab time, and we'll do that in CMK 111, okay, not upstairs. Um, and so pre or that pre-lab section on Wednesday, Dr. Davidson um, offered to do a, an impromptu recitation. This isn't for extra credit. It's not planned, okay, but he's going to be doing some um, some review problems, which is handy because I think next Wednesday is the last lecture of module two, three, okay? And so we have a test in a week and a half, um, so that could be a nice test review. So, any questions on next Wednesday? No pre-lab. Since there wasn't um, much of like the central stuff on the actual like the central stuff in the past test, did that roll over to the central? So Mike asked if there, because there wasn't any centroid stuff, on this last test, will it be on the third test? The flat out calculate a centroid of a shape okay, isn't totally interesting or applicable. Um, so that type of problem will not be on your test. You may see it on a final. I don't know. I haven't made it. But you need those centroids prin centroid principles with distributed loading. Okay, so how to calculate the centroid of a distributed load is completely fair game. Okay, but just flat out, here's a shape, calculate the centroid. That's module two stuff. But if you have a curve with an equation and you need to find the centroid, you might need to use some integration tools. All right? Um, so today will be relatively short. Uh, we'll pass back the tests about 940, and there's a couple things to talk about with that. Um, but today we are actually starting interesting statics. Okay, so thanks for bearing with us. For the first half of the class, um, we have been just pretty much developing tools and I'm sure you've been frustrating and asked the classic question of why do we even care about this? Um, we get to apply it today. And so whether you go into structural engineering, architecture, you like mechanics, um, you go into fluids, you go into HVAC, all of that stuff, all of that huge broad picture of, di of um, mechanics is analyzing structures. Okay? And so in statics, we have been developing these tools about how to analyze them in equilibrium, in static equilibrium, which is a small snapshot of real world, but it's, we got to start somewhere, okay? And so for us to analyze real structures, we need to understand what that actually means. And so a structure in mechanics is any sort of assembly or um, composite bodies that's, that's, that's composed of individual bodies, okay? So any sort of machine, um, a simple machine, a frame, a truss, any of that, that type of object is composed of individual pieces, right? That's not taking into account 3D printing. And so that's an interesting um, topic of the future that is kind of nobody really knows. Um, but as of now, how we machine uh, structures are individual bodies. Okay? 
And so we will analyze them as individual bodies. And so I've been telling you guys, our free body diagrams will become important when we analyze structures. Okay? And so today that starts. Your free body diagrams of each individual body and the forces you put on that now mean something. Okay? So now I can actually, you may understand why I take points off for you not drawing a free body diagram. Because if you don't do that, it, it affects your problem. Okay? So structures in mechanics are composed of a bunch of individual bodies and they are designed to carry, to hold loads, or to transmit them, transmit or modify them. Okay, any sort of structure, if it's stationary and it's this table, is just a, a, some sort of frame that's designed just to hold stuff. Okay, any sort of loading condition that can be held or modified is a structure that we will define. Okay, and those loads, okay, those loads are consisting now of external and internal loads. And we will get to that in a moment, but up until this point, we really only worried about external forces. Okay, but as we deal with structures, we need to know what's going on in, in them. Okay? But in this class, in the next four lectures, okay, and that is all of module three, okay, we will analyze structures. And the first most obvious structure is a truss. Okay, and so this is what you read last night, and we will spend today and Friday learning tools with how to analyze a truss. In your lab four, which you will have your pre-lab next Tuesday, you're going to actually be building, building a truss, and it's going to be a competitive environment of your, your product. Um, but a truss, we will categorically define as a, a, a bunch of rigid bodies composed together that are only two force members. Okay, and so when we introduce rigid bodies and we decompose them with two force members right, that are equal and opposite, okay, because of their reaction forces, they're equal and opposite, that's a two force member. All right? Um, and we will, today we will look further at um, the description of a truss. Okay. But the second, second structure that we will analyze next week is a frame. Okay. This, can, this is fully constrained, meaning all of the ends are fixed. With a truss, you can have some sort of a cantilever, cantilever truss hanging off the edge. Um, with a frame, it's fully constrained, okay. and you can have external forces applied anywhere. Okay. And so that will become more clear on Monday when you can just slap on a force in the middle, okay, you can have a member attached in the middle of anoth another member. Okay, that's the difference between a truss and a frame, and it, it'll make more sense as we, as we look at those in more detail. And the third structure is a machine. Okay, and this might be the most interesting, I think, because this is where your engineering decisions, as you're designing things, are affecting your output. Okay, a machine is designed to both transmit and modify forces. Okay, and we do that with our mechanical advantage whether it be simple machines like a pulley, a lever, a wedge, okay, any sort of pump, um, those simple machines are changing your input force. Okay? And so hopefully the input force is less than what is output. Okay? That's the whole concept of mechanical advantage. Okay? And so that we will work with I think next Wednesday, and that up to machines will be the last lecture of Module 3. Okay? And so looking at structures as a whole, these internal and external forces, okay, we can't think of them as the same thing anymore. Okay, so we need to be able to understand the difference between the two and why we analyze them differently. Okay, so internal and external forces will show up from here to the end of the class, okay, not just, not just in module three. Okay, module four is consisted a big part of internal forces. Okay, and remember with statics, Unfortunately, we can't take into account any material properties, and so all of those decisions, those internal forces are largely dependent upon the material, but that's not um, a concept in this class. You'll have that in the winter with Dr. Laz. Okay? So an external force, I want you to think of as any sort of force or, la or load that's applied on the outside of a structure. Okay? That's all we've been doing up until this point. We've had forces, we've had point forces, we've had distributed forces, We've had reaction forces, okay? Any sort of force that's on the outside of the, of the structure, okay? So some examples of that, like I just said, are an applied force, okay? A normal force that's on the outside of a structure, okay? A tension, a tension on a pulley, um, friction. We haven't done friction yet. That will be in module four, but we need to consider that as an external force, okay? A air resistance on a wing, okay? These aren't continuous, and they depend on the state of your structure, okay? And an internal force is anything that's due to the nature of the structure. 
Okay, so think of it as anything that's holding stuff together and making it move. Okay, and so in trusses, you'll see how this um, how this uh, plays plays into account. Hey, Stu, can you make sure this is still recording? It it locked. Um, any sort of internal force is something that's holding the structure together. Okay, so in biomechanics, you know that's my research. Okay, if we consider this person doing a bodyweight squat, okay, what are the ex what is the most obvious external force? What's that? Gravity, no. The weight getting warmer. The normal force. Okay, that reaction force that's holding it up. Okay, gravity acts everywhere. Okay, it acts both externally and internally. So we consider gravity an internal force. Okay, it acts everywhere, it's conservative. Okay, our internal forces, okay, that picture on the right, what do you think your internal forces would be? Yeah, Asher? Your, like your knee joint forces, your contact forces between the bones, okay, those are holding your body together. Okay, my femur is not going to come crashing down in between my, my tibia, that would be awful. What's that? Ligaments and muscles. Okay, what's actually moving us? Okay, so in a somewhat real-time, real-time video, okay, if we see somebody walking, okay, their normal force, that reaction force that's keeping them from falling in between the ground, is dependent upon the point of contact. Okay, so you can see that green arrow as they step. Okay, that is the force on the ground that's applied at the foot. Okay, so as you walk, that reaction force moves. Okay, it's not continue. It's not. It's non-conservative. Okay, but your muscles and your ligaments and your joint contact force, what is actually holding you together and causing movement, is an internal force. Okay. So I know that's a, a bit deviated from what we're doing in statics. Okay, but our principles apply. So think of internal forces as forces that are holding your structure together. Okay. And so with trusses, we're going to spend the rest of the week on trusses, and your entire lab four is on trusses, okay? We, need, we have two methods that we will use to solve it, okay? And so today, we're going to introduce one of them, and on Friday, we'll introduce the second method that is, um, they're both different, and they're both just as valuable. Um, but trusses have been around forever, they, like 2000 BC that I Googled, okay? Because they're so simple, and they're cheap, and they're efficient because the amount of material needed to build a truss is very minimal in comparison to the amount of load that it can hold. Okay, so a truss um, has some very specific characteristics that we need to define. Okay, the first being that a truss consists of only straight members. Okay, so if you see any sort of structure that has a, a piece with a 90 degree turn or an I-beam or any sort of, of member that has, that's not continuous in, in the straight longitudinal axis, okay, it's not a truss. That will be a frame, and that's what we'll cover next week. Okay, so a truss has straight members only. Okay. It also has um, a characteristic that says trusses are connected only at the pin joints. Okay. Only at the pin joints. So if you see any sort of, of member in a structure okay, that has two pin joints, and I'm just looking at these two members, and a second member that is connected in the middle of this, of this, this diagonal member, okay, that is not a truss. That is a frame. Okay? So these pin joints, <coughs> in the context of external and internal forces, are important. Okay? If I don't have a pin joint and I have a fixed joint, how are my reaction forces different? Think about a fixed, a fixed joint, okay, like a telephone pole. What do your constraint forces look like? Sergio, what do you think? Exactly. Sergio said we have two constraint for two or three, depending on the degrees of freedom, two constraint forces that are preventing translation 
and a reaction moment to prevent that torque. Okay. Trusses are consisted only of pin joints because if they are fixed, that external moment okay, applies throughout the entire member. Okay. And you'll see that members and trusses only have internal forces. Okay. Joints have external and internal, but members of a truss only have internal forces. And because we know that those resultant moments okay, are free vectors, they apply anywhere, pin joints are needed to define a truss. Okay. This, is just, this just stands for trusses. Does that make sense? Okay. That's different for a frame, okay, but for a truss, they are supported only by pin joints within the truss. Okay. The third characteristic is that a truss is loaded only at each joint. Okay. That coincides with what, was, what we just discussed, okay, in that these, the members of a truss only carry internal forces. Okay. So if you see any sort of loading condition, okay, like that, where these external forces are applied directly to the member, this is not a truss, this is a frame. Okay, and so that'll make more sense as we discuss frames next week. Okay, but for the rest of the week, we're only dealing with trusses in which the loading conditions only occur at the joints. Okay. The third, or the fifth, fourth characteristic that isn't totally um, applicable to us, um, but something worth bringing up, I think, is that these members of a truss, in respect to space and the loads they carry, are relatively very slender. Okay? And so because of that and because of how they're designed, they, they can support very little lateral load. Okay? If you get some big, big machine out in San Francisco Bay and you apply a force okay, to the, the Golden Gate Bridge, the force required to knock it over okay, in comparison to a longitudinal load okay, would be less. They don't, carry, uh, they don't carry lateral loads well. Okay. That's not something that we will be analyzing, but it's something worth um, bringing up, I think, as you potentially could go into some sort of structural engineering. Okay. And to account for that, people build these three-dimensional trusses um, that can carry these lateral loads, and that's really complex and people much smarter than I design, design these three-dimensional trusses. Okay, so in your head, as you look at trusses and you analyze trusses, just know that the forces that they are designed to, to carry are in the, typically in the J direction. Okay, that's why like cars or distributed loading or any sort of stuff like that is always happening vertical. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. And so, if we consider, let's consider this, this example truss okay, as we derive these tools to analyze them. I believe this is in your notes. This is how I will draw trusses, and this is how I think your book doesn't because they have computer power. Okay. But because we know a truss is only connected by pin joints, each of these connections we, will, we understand is a pin. Okay? So it's totally fine for you to solve your, pro your homework like this, your test problems, okay. but knowing that there are joints here. Okay? At every member, connect at every connection between these members, there is a joint. Okay? So if we look at joint B, okay, this bottom right corner here, how many members compose joint, that entire section of joint B? We have two. There's a vote for two. Any other, any other guesses? Who says two? Who says one? Three? Four? Four? 17? Okay. It's actually three. Okay. Trusses are connected by pin joints. Okay. And so from here on out, we need to separate out our free body diagrams. And so we need to represent that joint. Okay. So if we blow up 
this connection at B, okay, there are three joints, or three members. Two members and a joint, okay? So we know that the joint can carry external forces, okay? And so when you're solving trusses with the method of joints, which is what we are going to do today, okay, you always start with your joint, okay? So you're going to pick a joint, you're going to blow it up, okay, and start with that analysis, okay? And so you'll see that as we analyze this problem, this is a little bit of overkill, okay? But if we draw our forces, okay, at joint B, okay, we know there is an external force, RB, and there is a force, DB, and a force, BC. Okay. There is a force exerted on the joint with respect to these internal, these internal forces on the member. Okay. So on this free body diagram of joint B, how many external forces do, are there? One. What is it? RB. RB, the reaction at B. Okay. A reaction force is an external force. Okay, recall that an internal force is something that's holding your structure together. So in this free body diagram, what is your internal force? What are your internal forces? Yeah, Keenan? Yeah, well, F, yeah, FB, FC, yeah, FDB. FBC and FDB, or FBD, or however you choose your notation. These internal forces of the member, okay, that we represent at the joint, okay, these are internal forces. So because we always start with our joint, okay, we will draw okay, our internal forces equal and opposite to the joint. Okay? With your internal forces, okay, and if you haven't been paying attention now, or until now, that's fine, but pay attention to this. With your internal forces, start with drawing them all in tension. Okay? Draw them all away of, of pointing away from the member. Okay? What is putting tension on your member or on your joint? So when you, with the method of joints, okay, when you get a force okay, and you start with your joint, draw your internal forces in tension. Okay? And this is because our signs, positive or negative, now have a, a meaning associated with them. With internal forces and trusses, we will associate positive, a positive force, to be tension. Okay? because we've drawn them all in tension. Okay? And we, are, we will associate a negative force as compression. Okay? And so this characteristic on your free body diagrams is critical. Okay? And this is a nomenclature that your book uses, that I will use, that 99% of people in any sort of structural engineering will use, okay? that compression is negative. If for some reason you choose to do that differently, I highly recommend you don't, but you need to be able to justify why, that needs to be consistent. Okay? The sign convention is up to you, okay, but intuition tells us that tension is positive and compression is negative. Okay? So with the method of joints, okay, start with a, a joint that you know, okay, that you've solved for a reaction force. Okay? And you'll see as we work through a problem, I think this uh, tripped up a couple people on the reading quiz, when you start with a joint, okay, you need to have less than two unknowns because with the method of joints, okay, with these internal forces, we only have two equations of equilibrium. We can't sum the moments about joint B, okay, because we're kind of pulling out these structures and analyzing them individually. So our equilibrium equations are only the sum of the forces. Okay. Some of the moments, however, we use as a whole to solve for the reaction forces. Does that make sense? might make more sense when we work an example. Okay. So then if this were a problem, you would move to another joint. Okay. We've solved for all the forces at joint B. Okay. We would say move to, to joint D. Okay. We draw all of our internal forces okay, in tension. Okay, I'm not going to name them. Draw them in tension. Okay. We've solved for this force. So we know what that is, okay? and then you can kind of work, work throughout. And it's a very systematic approach 
okay, that I hope is pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's work an example. Okay, and as I'm erasing the board, okay, I want to pause for a second and tell you guys that we, from here on out, aren't really introducing any new methods. Okay, there's no new um, math associated with how to solve these problems. Okay, statics is very simple in terms of how we're approaching these problems with terms of our rigid body equilibrium, okay, our, our internal external forces. Um, some of the moments, all of the stuff that we've developed in here on out, we will use to solve these different types of problems. Okay, so hopefully you've developed these skills and you're comfortable with them, but now we need to learn how to apply them to a different type of problem. Okay, so if we consider this truss, okay, that is, and I know that picture is pretty awful, is supported at a roller at A. Okay, and a pin, a pin connection at C. I draw my free body diagram of the entire structure. I draw my free body diagram, and so I need to solve, so I'm going to go back a slide. I first need to solve for the reaction forces, okay? So when you see a truss, okay, whatever is constraining it, okay, apply your reaction forces, okay, with what we developed, what we learned in module two. So if I have a roller at A, what is the reaction force? What's that? A Y. A Y, excellent. Okay, if I have a pin connection at C, what are the reaction forces? Cx and Cy. And with reaction forces, recall that direction is arbitrary. With reaction forces, direction is arbitrary. With internal forces, direction is not arbitrary. Is that a very clear distinction for you guys? With reaction forces, direction is arbitrary. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay? And I hope your intuition here is telling you that I've drawn CX incorrectly. We'll let our math tell it. Okay? With internal forces, our math will tell us that we've drawn it incorrectly, but that has a meaning. And in order for that to have a meaning, we need to draw it consistently. So with internal forces, they are drawn in tension, because that is positive. Okay? That's a big one. Okay? That's a Fair game for a conceptual question. So I want to make sure that's clear. Okay. Can I repeat that? With internal forces, direction is not arbitrary. Tension is positive. With external forces, your reaction forces, okay, the math tells you it's pointed to the left or pointed to the right. Okay, but you'll see with the method of joints as we analyze these internal forces. If it's pointing to the left or pointing to the right, that means tension or compression. And we need to designate tension as positive. So that's why we draw our internal forces all in tension. Okay. So your first step, okay, when you're analyzing a truss, is you need to solve for the reaction forces. So we have this truss as a whole. Okay. So to solve for the reaction forces, A, Y, C, Y, and C, X, how would you do that? Some of the forces? Yeah? What, what direction? You do Y first, okay. So we sum the forces in the Y. We know it equals zero. Static equilibrium holds forever in statics. Sum the forces in the Y. AY plus CY minus 2400 minus 1200 equals zero. Can we solve it? Not yet. Okay. What's another equation of equilibrium that we can use? Some of the forces in the x. And it only means something if I've designated what x and y are. Okay. Some of the forces in the x. I have 600 plus cx 
equals zero. There's only two horizontal forces. So in solving for Cx, I get that Cx is negative 600 pounds. Okay? All that means with a reaction force is you've drawn it incorrectly. Okay? So I highly recommend when you are solving for your reaction forces, and if you've guessed wrong, which is fine, it happens all the time, to update your free body diagram. Okay? Draw these correctly. Okay? Because in the method of joints, these reaction forces show up. We need to know their true position, true orientation. Okay? So, we still have two unknowns. We need another equation. And we know that's some of the moments. Where would you sum the moments about? I'd probably do C. Okay, that's, we can knock out two of those unknowns. Okay, you could sum them about A just as easily. Okay, but for the sake of the class today, I'm going to sum the moments about point C. Okay. What does that equation of equilibrium look like? What do you think, Ryan? A-Y? So these are, yeah, the distance from A to D, 8 feet and 8 feet, 16 feet, that effective moment arm. Okay, because this is a planar problem, we can solve this with our scalar shortcut. You can use vectors just as fine. Okay. We have our vertical force and our horizontal distance, our scalar approach. Okay. Is that positive or negative? negative, okay, because the rotation that AY that it causes on C is in the clockwise direction. Okay, our right hand rule stands. Okay, what else? Yeah, Jack? Uh, 2400 2, times, times 8. And that's Excellent, and that is positive. And that's it, okay? This 1,200 pound force and the 600 pound force, because they're sliding vectors, okay, they act at A. Okay, so there is no moment arm between them. Okay? At C, excuse me, sorry. Okay? So we have one unknown here. So we can solve for AY to be 1,200 pounds. It's positive. So we, end it, we know that we've drawn it correctly. Okay. So then I can go through, back up to my equation that I've summed the forces in the y, okay, and solve for cy, okay, and cy also equals 1,200 pounds. Okay. So I've drawn both of those correctly. Yeah, Stefan? So Stefan asks why the 600 and the 1,200 pound force don't matter. Can somebody put that in their own words? Yeah, Dan? Bubba? I was just going to say 2,400. Is it 2,400? Yeah, that's probably absolutely right. Good catch. So I solved it wrong, so I hope someone has their calculator out. Okay. So Stefan asked, why do the 600 pound force and the 1,200 pound force not apply a moment at C? Nick, can you say that in your own words? So he said, mathematically, if you sum the forces at, or if you sum the moments at point C, okay, their moment arm, their effective moment arm is zero. In this case, we have a J force, we have 1200 J, okay, and our moment arm would be 6 J. Okay, so if we're doing this in vectors, which is totally fine, 
Okay, I typically am in the habit of not solving trusses with vectors because it gets nasty. And in this class, we will only do two-dimensional trusses. Okay, so I typically use a scalar approach. They don't apply a moment at C because there is no moment arm. Okay, these are sliding vectors, so that also acts up there. Does that make sense? Did you guys have a question down here? Well, on the same topic, I get that 1,200 force, but to me, I kind of see that 600 force and perpendicular to that six feet. That makes sense. Or I should know, I guess. So think about it still as a, as a, a sliding vector. It's acting in the line of C. There is no effective moment arm. That horizontal force has no vertical distance. You got Morris? So do we even have to like actually solve for those as just a sliding vector? Because we could set that to the x and the x is only 600. So let's just do like the 1200. So we did that with the sum of the forces. Yeah, did we actually like actually do that? Yeah, because if you sum the forces in the y, how do you know that cy No, because I don't think that's always true. Okay, In the method of joints it is, but as a whole, I don't think that's a safe practice to get in. When you're solving trusses and you're solving for the reaction forces, which you do first, so you need to sum the moments about somewhere. Okay? So, with method of joints, we've solved for the reaction forces. We need to pick a joint where we have two unknowns. Okay. We can't pick a joint that we have three unknowns because we only have two equations of equilibrium with joints. So I'm going to begin with joint A. Okay. Begin with joint A. Okay. So in this case, I have an external force. The reaction at A is 1,200. I got that one right, right? A-Y is right. Okay, 1,200. Okay, I have a force F-A-B and F-A-E. Okay, I draw these internal forces in tension. Okay, and looking at the geometry of these members, okay, this triangle is 8 feet and 6 feet. I can reduce that to a 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5 triangle. If you guys are more comfortable solving this with sines and cosines, that's fine. All you need is your rectangular components with your equations of equilibrium. Okay. So we've drawn our free body diagram at joint A. We've plucked out joint A and we're analyzing it separately. Our internal forces are represented in tension. Okay. So I apply my equations of equilibrium, which are the sum of the forces. Okay. So I'm going to begin with the sum of, uh, sum of the forces in the y. Why is that an easier approach? What's that? I would only have one unknown, right? FAB has a y component. I sum the forces in the x, I have FAB and FAE, and I can't solve that yet. But because I have two unknowns here, and if I started with fx, that's fine. I would know I'd have to go to fy then to solve. So I'm going to begin with fy. I have 1,200 okay, plus the force in AB. Okay, I've drawn it in tension, bless you. And in this case, it's pointing in the positive y. So the rectangular component of the force in AB is 3 fifths. Okay. So solving for FAB, I get it is negative 2,000 pounds. The internal force in member AB is 2,000 pounds, the magnitude of it. Okay. But this member is in compression okay, because this is negative. Okay. So to denote that and how your book does it, most of your trust problems will be find the force in each member and indicate tension or compression. Okay. You can do 2,000 pounds and that is in compression. 
Yeah, Mike? Can you draw what looks like the, the difference between tension and compression of the trail? So if I draw the member, okay, this member, AB, is in compression. Okay, so the internal forces, if we're analyzing this member separately, the internal forces are applying a compression. Okay, but with the method of joints, what's so great about it is we don't need to solve it. Okay, our method of joints, we can just solve these at a point. Okay, and that's a little easier than solving big rigid bodies. Okay. So now I can apply my second equation of equilibrium and sum the forces in the x. Okay. And I get the force in AE okay, minus 2,000 pounds times 4 fifths. This is minus because I know that this force in AB is in compression. Okay. The signs mean something now. So when you find a member that is in compression, update your free body diagram. Okay? Or make sure you know to put a minus. Yeah, Hannah? How did you get the five four three triangle? So this is eight feet. Hannah asked how I got the five three four five triangle. Okay. So it's eight feet and six feet. So that's six, eight, okay, the hypotenuse is ten. And I've reduced it divided by two. So three, four, five, okay, is typically what you'll see that a lot in trusses. Okay. Okay. So now that I've solved for the force in Fe, which becomes sixteen hundred pounds, and that is positive. So it is in tension. Okay. Yeah, Curtis? Um, when solving these, do you want us to draw a separate free body diagram for each pin, or can we draw them all in the first one and then just refer to it? You need to draw a separate free body diagram for every pin. Okay. I think that's the best way for you to stay organized with your signs because they mean something. Okay. So now that we've solved for the, the force in each of mem in member A, B, and A, E, okay, you then would go to another joint. Okay. I'm not going to finish solving this because I need to introduce another concept and then hand back the tests. Okay, but I will post it today. I really recommend you solving this, this problem. Okay. But go, you, you solve the members in the, in the, you solve for the force in the members, go to another joint. Okay. I went to joint E. Okay. You just kind of work your way around the truss and solve for all of the forces in the member, in each member. Okay. And so with truss problems, typically they ask for what is the force in each member? This is an important design, de design, um, important design information because you need to know if it's going to fail. That's a materials property thing, but you need to know the m force in each member. Okay. So in your reading last night, okay, they introduced this concept of zero force members. Okay, and I think a lot of people were confused about that. But zero force members were specifically designed okay, to allow trusses to transmit loads. Okay, and so if we see this problem, okay, and based on what you've learned with the method of joints today, okay, of how long it took us to analyze one joint, how long do you think it would take you to analyze that truss? Forever. How many, I mean, there's 30 joints on there, okay? So with trusses, two things to look out for. Okay, the first, what do you notice about this truss, loading conditions aside? It's symmetric. Okay. This truss is symmetric. Okay. So solving trusses by symmetry okay, is a very nice tool to recognize. Okay. If you see a truss that, has, that is loaded, loaded symmetrically, okay, we can analyze it. Analyze it um, you can just say by symmetry. Yeah, Keenan? So like, let's say if you didn't have CY and CX there, so it was ABD, it would just be 1,200 for AY. Yeah. Okay. So Keenan asked if my truss was just like this, okay, there wasn't anything holding it, right? That wouldn't be a constrained truss, so it w there would have to be another um, constraint in the X, okay? But I could analyze it by symmetry, okay? 
Another thing to look out for, and this is a big concept, is a zero force member. Okay? A zero force member is exactly what it means. It is a member of a truss that has zero loading in it. Okay? So if you look at joint B, okay, let's say we've analyzed all of our reaction forces and now we're going through and we're solving for the, mem the forces in each member. Okay. We solve for the force BC, AB, and BD, okay, using our equations of equilibrium. What do you notice about the force in member BD? There isn't. If I sum the forces in the Y, okay, FBD equals zero. Okay, this is a zero force member that we've, we've recognized using our method of joints. What other zero force members do you recognize on this truss? Would GH be one? GH? What's that? JL is not a zero force member because there's an external force. NO is. Okay. That applied load, okay, transmit, even though it's applied at N, okay, the Y force, if you go through and analyze it, you will find that the force in NO is zero if you look at your free body diagram of joint O. Okay. Zero force members are designed to, to prevent buckling as these loading conditions change. <coughs> So when you're building a truss, okay, that 100 kilonewton force that's acted in the down, the negative J, okay, that could be a car that's moving along. So member BD isn't always a zero force member, okay, but if there isn't a joint there, if there isn't a member there, okay, that's not going to end well for the per person in that car. Okay. So I will post the full worked out solutions for both of these, okay, and I want to talk a bit about the test. Okay. So the average was almost a 74, which is a little better than the first exam, okay? But I w was hoping that it would be a little higher, okay? When writing a test, you want to see an average of like a 78 or an 80, okay? From working with all the faculty, that's what they use as a good test, okay? Especially in engineering. And so we had someone who got 100, which was great. We had someone who got a 36, which is not so great. So I'm like, why? What's going on? And I've kind of qualitatively notice an attendance problem. Okay, even today we have about 10 or 15 people who aren't here. And ironically, those are probably the 10 or 15 people who are in the red. Okay. So I separated it out by these people who have not been coming to the class. Okay. You are adults. Okay. Attendance is not mandatory. I don't care. You guys are paying a lot for tuition. Each credit hour is a big financial commitment. Okay. So it's up to you. But in looking at this, and looking at the average of you folks who do come to class, the average is almost an 80. And so that's really encouraging to me. But what's really frustrating is these folks in red. And a lot of them aren't here today, ironically. Some of them are. So if you did not do well on the second exam, and ask yourself if you've missed more than two classes. If you've been sick, okay, that's on you. You need to come see me. If you don't think you need to come to class and you can learn out of the book, there are some folks in the red who got 80s, but most of you don't, okay, in the red. So in engineering, you can't not come to class, okay? This isn't a distribution that gets you a degree. So for you folks in blue, this does not apply to you. Keep it up. You guys are doing great, okay? I really think that your study habits have improved. I've seen more of you. You've done better on, this t on the test. But for you folks in red, okay, and if you're friends of them, okay, haven't seen any of them in office hours, and they did not perform well. So that's extremely frustrating, and I don't have a lot of sympathy. Okay? So I just I want you guys to all do well. I want everybody to be in the blue, but I can't hold your hand. Okay, so I know you have class, so we will pass back the tests. Okay? I will post these lectures on Canvas. <laughs>